We're all good, by the way, if you want to hop in, okay. if you want to get in my van. <laughs> Did you fit okay? Yeah. Nice. How many people over six foot have you had? <laughs> um, I've had a, let's see, a Zach Retz. He is, I think, 6'1", uh, probably about my height. Um, I think you're you are you're probably actually the tallest person, yeah. besides Scott. I think <laughs> Scott Scott is I think the uh, tallest man that I've had in here so far. Uh, so as a disclaimer, I have to keep checking these cameras every 20 minutes because they turn off by themselves. Okay. Um, and uh, would you like to start the fire? Uh, sure. Cool. Do you just light the fluid, or is there actually yeah, a wick? Yeah, yeah, you just light the fluid. Do you know, do you know where I got this uh, this from? This this thing? Yeah. Well, no idea. I got it from Katie Silva in Austin. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a video of her giving it to me on on the podcast with her. <laughs> I don't know where she got a zebra skin one. I think it's just CVS. I mean, yeah. It's just like a generic. We we have you know. the exact same thing, but it's red. Oh dang. Fucking bic, non <laughs> exclusive lighters. Um, yeah, I think we're going. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I guess uh, I guess the way I normally start this is uh, the point of this is not to talk about technique or it's not to talk about like getting better at anatomy or any of that kind of stuff. Okay. It's like, it's like the why of doing all this stuff. You know? Okay. And when I look at somebody like you, you somebody you're you're somebody who's like focused really heavily on the traditional side of art. You know, mm -hmm. you, you've gotten really good at figure drawing and anatomy and oil painting and all that kind of stuff. And I'm always yeah. curious about like like why like why I focus so much time on on that specifically, you know? And, and, and I guess, what does art mean to you in general? Like, um, why have I spent so much time focusing on it? I've never really given it that much thought other than uh, it's what I like drawing. Yeah. I mean, the, the human figure is the thing I enjoy drawing the most, or, you know, derivations of the human figure. Right. Um, if not the human figure, you know, just uh, animals, you know, people. Now, tech, I, I don't mind drawing it, but it's not, I enjoy drawing, you know, animals, people, things right. like that a lot more. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's why I always focus on, I mean, I, my, what got me into drawing uh, initially and what I still do is, is comics. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, yeah, you have to be able to draw everything, but if you can't draw a cool figure, you're going to be... Right. in trouble yeah, you know yeah. if you can't draw a cool skyscraper you might be able to squeeze by right but if you can't draw a cool looking person you're yeah. gonna you're gonna be in for a long haul yeah so. well I, I guess what I mean more existentially is like I think that doing art in general is a very hard career you sure know? and I guess it's like uh, I mean you've worked really hard at it you mm -hmm. know and you've sacrificed a lot of you know other career opportunities to do it the way that you want to do it exactly mm -hmm. right and I guess I'm, I'm always like you know I think the hardest thing about art is not learning the technique at all. No, no. I think it's that's actually the really easy part. You can learn it in less than five years, no matter who you are. Sure. I mean, I think the hardest part is like keeping like keeping the reason to do it for thirty or forty or fifty years. Right. You know? It's like why you know why do this thing that is difficult? Why do this thing that you make less money, you get less recognition? You know, it's like um, not necessarily, not necessarily less recognition, but it's, no, I, I understand yeah. what you're saying. I mean, you know, if 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 fame and money is what you're after, which can be, you know, it can come with art, but if that's what you're after, yeah, <laughs> yeah. art is not probably the easiest path to that. Right. Um, I mean, there's way easier ways of pursuing that. Yeah. Um, I never, I didn't know it until I got to be about 17 or 18 years old, but I didn't, I never really wanted to do anything else. Yeah. I just didn't really uh, acknowledge it as a, uh, a viable career path because, you know, Especially where and when I grew up, I didn't know any artists growing up. I mean, I didn't know any even creatives, you know, as far as people who did it for a living. Um, and so I didn't really know that that was a viable career path or if it was how to go about pursuing it. Um, so that was the only reason. But once I kind of started realizing that this was a viable career path, then... I started pursuing it. It's, yeah. it's all I wanted to do, and right. that's what I did pretty much all the time. Yeah. Uh, I got frustrated for a time because I didn't feel like I was getting the education, right. uh, meaning the 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 objective aspects of art, yeah. um, which is what you mentioned, you know, the the technique. Right. And you're right. I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd go so far as to say it's the easy part, but it's the very 
It's understandable. Yeah, it's understandable. It's direct. Yeah. It's like learning anything it's, it's else. It's binary, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like learning anything else. There is a right and a wrong way to do it. Right. Now, there isn't a right and wrong way to how you apply it, yeah. but, you know, edges work a certain way. Right. You know, it's, 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 there is a science to it. Yeah. You know, proportions are a objective, measurable thing. Right. You know, values are an objective, measurable thing. These are all things that are, that are uh, easy to wrap your brain around if you have someone who knows what they're talking about explaining it to right. you. Um, the more subjective things, uh, style, storytelling, composition, even color to a certain degree, um, the, the more expressive side of art, the, yeah. the individual part of art, that becomes a lot more difficult only because it's painful. Yeah. Uh, I actually don't think it's more difficult. Yeah. Uh, to me, the, the technique is the more difficult art because it is very objective. It's right. very, you know, there is a right and a wrong to it. So you have right. to get it right. Right. It's, I would say it's more challenging. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the subjective aspect, the, the, right. the artistic part yeah. is, is, uh, more painful. Yeah. But I wouldn't say it's more difficult because there's almost, there's no wrong way to do it. Right. I mean, in my opinion, there is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. but, but you know, you can do anything and if you do it well enough, then there really anything can be art. I mean, that is a true yeah. statement. Right. If you do it well enough, anything can be art. There's no right. bad style. There's no bad uh, um, judgments. It's right. just how do you execute it? And that's again where the technique part part right. of it comes into. Yeah. Um, as far as why do I do it? Um, being a sword, you know, if you do anything right, it's all hard. Yeah. You know, I don't care what. It, if if you're gonna go be a landscaper, if you do it right. It's hard. Yeah. Um, if you're going to go be a, a driver, right. if you do it right, it's hard. Yeah. Everything is hard if you do it right. The thing is, there isn't room in the industry for people who don't do art well. Yeah. So that's why it's a right. little more difficult. There's no room for people in music who don't do it well. Yeah. You know, people may criticize certain musicians, certain singers, but you know what? If they're out there making a living at it, they're pretty good at it. Yeah. You know, if, if, if someone's making a living as an actor, they're pretty good at it. You know, maybe as an actor, right. they might be at the lower yeah. end of the scale, right? But if they're out there making a living at it, they're good. They're better yeah. than you and I. Right. You know, but, you know, there are professions out there that there's a lot of slackers. There's room for people to kind of slip through the cracks and right. not do their job well because no one else wants to do it. Yeah. You know, there's probably a lot of bad ditch diggers out there. Yeah. There's a lot of right. good, probably good ones too, but yeah. there's probably a lot of bad ditch diggers because it's a job not many well, people want to do. People that are better ditch diggers than you are an artist, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Amazing ditch diggers. Absolutely. Right? The yeah. thing is, I don't think those people stay ditch diggers very long. <laughs> no, no, maybe. <laughs> they usually move into, yeah. right. you know, they move up the ranks. Yeah. And, and art, and again, if someone's making an actual living, meaning paying their bills full time, making artwork, they're good at art. Yeah. You know, you may not like their work, but there there is something they do good, and if you don't see it, you just don't understand it. Yeah. Um, again, I'm not going to name any names, but I'm sure yeah. you already know who yeah. I'm who I'm thinking of, yeah. and I just don't want to get into that. Yeah. But you know, it's it's not always how well you draw. Yeah. There are other aspects of art. It's your vision. There are right. people that have an incredibly unique vision, and they don't need to draw. Right. Well, to, to do it, yeah. You know, they're they're a stylist, yeah. Um, and then there's other people out there. I I talk to some artists who draw amazingly well, and they say how they don't. So that tells you, you know, how good some of the people are out there. That there's right. amazing artists that are like, oh, I don't really draw that well. And it's like, no, you draw amazing. Right. Just maybe in comparison to other professional artists, right? You don't. Yeah. But compared to the population at large, you're yeah, one of the yeah, top sure. two percent in the world yeah, yeah. at drawing. Yeah. You're top two percent in anything. Right. That's pretty good. Well, and I, I find that that's actually really common is I meet people who are excellent draftsmen who feel like they're garbage because they're comparing themselves to people that are at the, t off the top 1% right. of... Uh, and not everything. even that, you know? but, but the top ever. Yeah. Like, right. I mean, how often do you yeah. hear artists compare themselves to John Singer Sargent? Right. You know, or, or whoever, you know, yeah. name artist, blah, 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 that, right. you know, is on the list that we all talk about. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so it's, we're not even comparing ourselves just to the best people that are doing it now, right. or the best people in our field. Yeah. You know, there's always there's the, there's the the concentric rings, right? Yeah. It's like it's like, well, how good am I compared to the other comic book painted comic book cover artists? Yeah. How good am I compared to the other cover artists? How good am I to the other comic artists? How good am I to you know? And the, and the rings get bigger and bigger and bigger, and all of a sudden you're comparing yourself to every artist who's ever lived. Right. 
it drives you to get good. Yeah. But it's maybe not the always the healthiest. I don't think it is. Mindset. Well, and I think it's I think you can't help it because the artists that are the best are the ones that you see the most. Right. You know? And that's the ones that inspire right. you to actually become an artist. You know? And also as you climb the ladder, you're gonna compare yourself to those people. Yeah. You know, like there may have been artists that I admired when I was young and now I look at their work and I go, eh. It's maybe not as good as I thought it was because yeah. I've gotten closer to them in ability level. Yeah, right. And so there's kind of always this thing as an artist that everyone who's better than you is amazing, right. and everyone who's as good or worse than you is yeah. a hack. Right. It's a, it's how almost every artist thinks. Yeah. Almost every artist thinks that right. way. And so as you get better, you start comparing yourself to that next tier of artists, just like yeah. an athlete would. Right. You know, in high school, you're comparing yourself to the other guys on your team or the other guys that you play against or gals that you play against, you know, your, your, your competition. Yeah. And you think you're good or maybe you don't, but let's say you think you're good. It's like, you're really not. Yeah. You're a high school baseball player. Right. It's like, yeah, you're a good high school baseball player. Yeah. But even the best high school baseball player is going to get you know, thumped yeah. in, in the pros. Right. You know, so you keep kind of going up this ladder and then you have, you know, rookie ball and single A and, you know, and you're, and you move your way up that ladder. And next thing you know, you're competing with the other all-stars in major league baseball. Yeah. And then when you're one of the best of them, then you're comparing yourself to you the know, best of all time, the best right? of all time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's just, it's something we do to ourselves. And like I said, I think it's human nature. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely human nature. And maybe it's not the healthiest thing in the world, but I do think that we need to strive for excellence and sometimes what drives us to strive for excellence isn't the healthiest thing yeah. <coughs> or, 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 excuse me or, or, or quit the fire by the way yeah that's okay. fine I just got a little edge cool um but it's <coughs> it's something we need to do yeah yeah um, well, so. and I, I guess I, I've been talking to a lot of artists about this kind of stuff and I really don't think it um I believe it, does, it doesn't actually matter how good you are or how bad you are, really. I mean, it's like the act of, no matter what you do, even if you're a professional or a beginner, the act of painting, you should be doing the same things. Yeah, yeah. Studying Absolutely. heads, you know. It, it's like, it, it actually doesn't matter how much better somebody is or somebody. No, no, somebody not in that moment. Yeah, yeah, right. You can't ever change where you are right now. Yeah. You right. can change where you're going to be in a year, yeah. in five years, in ten years. Right. And that's what you're training for. You're not training to get better today right. and it's something I'm always trying to get across to my students and I'm sure you remember hearing me say it in class it's like it it doesn't really matter how good your drawing is yeah. today it's about what you learn yeah. because that's going to allow you to make a better drawing tomorrow right nothing you do today right. is going to make your drawing better today yeah it's like going and running a mile right it's like you're in the kind of shape that you're in you've trained how you've trained you're going to yeah. go out and run i mean some mental things aside physically right. You're, you're it. That's it. You've already, you've already put in the work. Yeah. And you can't do anything to be faster today. Yeah. But what you do today will allow you to be faster in a month. Yeah. Or a year. Right. And art's very much the same way. You Absolutely. Know, yeah, yeah. Playing the piano and yeah, everything. Yeah, everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Literally everything. I mean, people like to make certain things lofty. You know, yeah. especially the arts. People love to make the arts more than what it is. Yeah. You know, meaning, meaning, you know, the traditional arts. Right. Um, you know, drawing, painting, uh, sculpting, dancing, music, right. acting. You know, these things because they don't really understand them. Right. But it, getting good is getting good. It doesn't yeah. matter right. what it is. I don't care if you're an engineer or, again, a landscaper or, yeah. you know, a construction worker or, well, and, you know, and whatever. I would also wager, I mean, you have a version of the dream job that you wanted as a kid. Sure. Right? Doing marble covers, you know, teaching, you know, doing working at the Watts, you know, sure. teaching, you know. Um, but then I, I would wager you still have days where you feel like a complete piece of garbage. You know? Well, most days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, most like, days, by the end of the day, yeah. I feel like garbage. And you can't escape that. You know, I found yeah. you can never escape that, you mm -hmm. know. It's like the way you feel right now as a student, if somebody's a complete beginner, is going to be the way they feel when they're probably a professional. It yeah, doesn't, yeah. doesn't change, you know. I think most people who get good at things, uh, meaning... Even even beyond good, so you know, there's there's kind of people who mail it in. There's average, which there's nothing wrong with that. Average, yeah. you're in the middle. You're better at your job of, of many people as you are not as good, right? You're right. you're in the middle. There's nothing wrong with that. Doesn't feel real good, but you know, there's <laughs> no, nothing I, wrong with I'm it. So, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I'm so average. Woo yeah, <laughs> mediocrity. That's what I aspire for. Yeah. Um, but then you know, then there's the good people, and then there's the exceptional people. Yeah. I would. Yes, just my own personal opinion. Most exceptional people are daydreamers. Yeah, I, I think you would have to be because to 
strive to be exceptional, you have to dream of being exceptional. Right. Because most people, they're not, no, I, I think very few people truly wake up and go, I am exceptional. Right. Like, and truly believe it. Yeah. But there are some people that dream of being exceptional. And when you right. can see that visual in your head, I think it allows you to keep pushing for it. Yeah. And I know they have studied that they have studied this in sports visualization. That's daydreaming. Yeah. You know, the, the right. kid that, you know, daydreams of, you know, hitting the game winning shot in the NBA finals, right. that kid is way more likely to end up hitting the game winning shot in the NBA finals than Absolutely. a kid that doesn't, yeah. that just kind of goes through the motions and maybe even loves basketball, but yeah. never sees himself as or herself being great. Yeah. Right. So even if it's not something that you actually think is a possibility, just the fact that you can visualize it, I think gets yeah. you a step closer to, to being that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think it's, uh, I mean, uh, you, you know, you always hear people talking about the idea of manifesting, you know, mm-hmm. like manifesting your vision or, you know, your, yeah. your vision for yourself and your dreams. And I think a big part of making something happen is actually just even thinking about it. Uh, uh, hey, what's up? <laughs> it happens. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like, um, something can't happen until you think of it. You know? Yeah, it's like even something like the space shuttle didn't. It started out on paper as ideas. It right, started right. out as just a conversation, exactly. And like even this, before you know? that, it, it yeah. started off probably yeah. uh, some kid watching a sci-fi movie. Yeah, absolutely. Or listening yeah. to sci-fi radio yeah, more yeah. than likely. Right. You know, yeah, back yeah. then, you know, the first right. the person who designed the first working rocket ship yeah. probably watched TV shows or movies or listened to radio shows that had. Right. rocket ships in them and he and he pictured it in his head right i mean th- there's no mystery that much of our technology looks conspicuously like what was science fiction yeah. before that because right. they designed it to look that way yeah. flip phones right tell me that guy wasn't a star trek fan yeah absolutely there's no way because it's not logical a flip yeah. phone is not a logical thing but he wanted yeah. to make it look like a star trek communicator yeah absolutely so i mean yeah. it's 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 the daydreamers that end up becoming exceptional more times than not. Absolutely. Yeah, well, and, and it's probably, st- like, even before that, it was, you know, a couple kids in just the middle of a cornfield looking up at the, the stars. Yeah, yeah. Know, just looking at the moon. Sure, you know? sure. Even even before sci-fi technology, it's like, yeah. you know, um, it started out in, you know, people in the 1500s just... You know, sitting in their backyards, looking up at the sky. You know? Really, I mean, you can probably honestly track it back to even yeah. primitive man or proto man. Yeah, yeah. You know, absolutely. they they visualize themselves making the great kill. Right. It's like, well, they knew they couldn't do that. They want to kill the biggest animal. Well, yeah. they can't do that. So then they start thinking, well, how can I do that? Right. And in their dreams, they're carrying a stick. Well, then the first spear gets invented. Right. You know, and so on and so yeah, forth down absolutely. the line. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's if you can't if you can't dream it, you can't do it. Absolutely, well, and I think it's like more from a more existential level. There, there is an objective way of look, looking at drawing that is wrong. I mean, it's true, but it's also right. wrong. It's like right. what you're doing when you're drawing with Conte on newsprint is you're rubbing one piece of wood against another piece of wood, mm-hmm. you know, and that's you're creating like an illusion of what a figure or an arm or a person looks like. Sure. Right? It's like, but th- that's not actually what it is. It's something no. way deeper than that. Like yeah, there's yeah. something primal that you're trying to do that is like people have been dra- drawing on the sides of caves for tens of yeah. thousands of years you know it's something more it's something more complicated than just well some people know. say that, it, that it's trying to tap into the 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 global conscious the yeah. the zeitgeist whatever things that we share in common that commonality wanting to belong yeah i mean a lot of things go back to wanting to belong and right. part of it is look i've got this picture in my head and i feel like i don't belong because of the way that i think yeah. well if i can show you what i'm thinking and you understand that i'm a little closer to belonging yeah you know, so it's it's a weird way of going about it, but I'm sure there's there's an element of that. You're you're trying to describe something that is indescribable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to explain a lot of the things that go on in my head with a picture than it is with words. Yeah. If I were gifted with words, then I would probably be a writer. Right. But I wasn't. It was it was always pictures. Yeah. I mean, I love language. People right. who who write well amaze me yeah. same thing with people who who make music yeah. not just play a musical instrument that's impressive as well but i'm talking right. about people who compose music right i don't get it right my brain just does not work that way and i'm sure if i studied i could understand it and do it at a mediocre level yeah but it's just not the way my brain works yeah my brain works in pictures always has yeah right. always has i mean as long as i can remember i always drew and even my parents didn't 
not that they didn't understand it, yeah. but it was something that they recognized early on that that right. I approached things a little differently. Yeah, you know, I I put things down in pictures. I didn't write things down. I didn't, you know, I mean, not not to a not to an extraordinary or or or. Uh, uh, learning deficit level, but yeah. but I certainly always saw things in pictures from early on. I was attracted to things, right. you know, like that. I mean, cartoons, comic books. No one really yeah. introduced me to that stuff. I couldn't even tell you how I first got into comics, to be honest. Yeah, um, it was just something that attracted me, and right. you know, I looked. At, I found out later on that my that my dad was into comics when he was younger. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know that at the time. Right. You know, he, he kind of had moved past that by the time, you know, I was old enough to, to know. Yeah. You know, and uh, so, but yeah. But right. then there were other things that, that uh, my parents and and, and, uh, and my aunt, my yeah. dad's sister, always encouraged. You know, they, they took me to movies all the time. Right. I mean, we were always going to movies. So they were always visually stimulating. I mean, probably because, I mean, A, they liked it too, but probably because they saw something. You know, they yeah. saw that that entertained me. And, right. I'd actually sit still and pay attention. You care about it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, there, there, were, there was a connection there. Right. But I also read a lot, so. Yeah. Um, but it, it, I can't say that writing ever right. really made sense to me. Even the only writing that I'm really interested in doing is comics because you can write in pictures. Yeah, right. You know, it's like, yeah, eventually you have to put dialogue in their mouth, but, yeah. you know, you you tell the story through pictures. Right. And that makes way more sense to me. Yeah. I don't understand how people write a story. Right. It's. I mean, I understand it, but it doesn't. It, w- it makes way more sense to me to show it in in show the passing of time through pictures. Yeah, that makes way more sense to me. Right. Well, and I, I guess to me, it seems like you know you're somebody who uh, has found their personal legend in a sense. It's like there are plenty of people that do think in pictures, or they think in music, or they think in something. You know. Right. But they become and no, no, nothing against accountants or dentists or anything. Right. right. They become an accountant or a dentist. They they find a more conventional path. Right. right. And it's like, what about? your path was different from it's like why didn't you go down like I know your 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 dad was a horseshoer mm-hmm. right it's like why didn't you go down that path why didn't you you know do something a little bit more I don't think he would have let me first off <laughs> I mean if, if, if I had really wanted to it's a, it's a at least I don't know about now um, but when I was young you could make a you could make my dad made a decent living I mean yeah. you could make a really good living it's a hard living yeah. you know like any you know manual labor it's it's hard, but but you can make a good living at it. You know, you can support your family. Yeah. You know, that's my qualifier qualifier for you know a good living is you you can support your family, you can pay your bills, and you have a little bit left over for the extra stuff. Right. And and we had that growing up. Um. But, so I don't think my dad would have. I, I mean, he he did not keep it a secret that he did not want my brother and I to be yeah. horseshoers. Right. Um, but if we would have pushed the subject, you know, he would have taught us to do it well and, right. you know, helped us along. If, if, But it would have been one of those things. I think he purposely discouraged us because if we did do it, it was going to have to be something that we wanted to do yeah. and not just follow in his footsteps. Yeah. Right. Um, but as far as the path that I took, I'll be honest. Um, well, I'd say two, two factors. One, I'm very stubborn. Yeah. Like, like almost... Neurotically so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Almost, almost, almost to a bad degree. I'm, I'm very loyal and very stubborn. Yeah. Um, once I pick something, I stick with it yeah. for sometimes past the line of reason. Right. Um, the other thing is good timing and luck. Yeah. So much of it was was good timing and luck, but part of that is because I stuck with things for so long that your odds of getting lucky yeah. go way, way up. If you yeah. try something once and it doesn't happen for you. Well, you can say that you're unlucky, but if you end up trying something a hundred times, yeah. your odds, you just, you know, yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Eventually someone is going to take notice just because you keep trying. Yeah. Even if you're not good at it, they will take notice just because you keep trying. Right. And I, oh, I kept trying. Yeah. I mean, I really didn't have my first, I didn't have my big break in comics until I was, shoot, 37, 38. Right. Um, and really, it hasn't become a, a really lucrative thing until probably the last two or three years. Yeah. Um, so it's you know, the, and and I've I've been trying since I was well, technically I've been trying since I was seventeen. Yeah. Um, but really, you know, as far as like what I'm actually doing now, I put together my first samples when I was twenty eight. Yeah. Right. So however long, almost twenty years. Yeah. 
Well, so, and I, I guess I guess it's uh, I meet people all the time who think that they have to do it in two years, right? It's like they leave high school and their parents give them two years to go to art school, right? Or two years of runway or something, right? You know, they saved a, bu- a bunch of money and right. they only have a couple of years to do it. And I think that that way of doing it, you know, sure there are people that you know, they're outlier success cases, but very I, few. I would I very very few. And I, I would say that those people, even the outliers, it, it's not the right way to do it. No, you know? it's like. You have to work incredibly hard and you have to get incredibly lucky on top of, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't feel correct. You know, it feels like it's not. And, and, and it, I don't think it's the best thing either, because if, if you figure so someone most people start that kind of on that phase of their life. Just to throw a number out there, say 19, 20, 21, 22, in that range, yeah. right? Late teens, early 20s is when most people start on that path. If you get it done in two years, if you start, if you get some success in two years, and you're even 24, 25, yeah. and you're locked into what you're going to do for the rest of your life, you're not even really formed as... The brain isn't even fully formed. Right? Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. You're you're locked in. That's why it, I think it's ridiculous when we have kids pick a college major when they're 18. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. That is absolutely <laughs> insane. Especially for art school too. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the for anything required. Yeah. For anything. That's why most people don't end up working in the field that they get their degree in because yeah. they just. Oh, it's almost arbitrary. I mean, it's not arbitrary. It's obviously something that interests you to some degree. Yeah. But it's like you don't know what you want to do with the rest of your life when you're 18. Most yeah. people. Right. Most people. I mean, I I Outliers wanted to do comic course. books, and yeah. I'm doing comic books. Yeah. And there's and there's some people out there. Comic books, in fact, in general, seem to be kind of unusual in that a lot of people, not now so much, but you know, back when I was young, there were a lot of people that broke in at 16, 17, 18, 19, yeah. 20 years old. Right. Um, and even historically, going back, yeah. broke in, and they did it for their whole career. Yeah. It's really unusual. Yeah. It's really, really unusual. Um, but... Uh, where was I going with this? Oh, um, and then, so it's, yeah, getting yourself locked into that kind of path that early on. Yeah, it's, even if it's good for you, yeah. there just aren't that many. I mean, the advance, the example I'll use is Chris Ron. Yeah. Um, you know, he's a friend of mine, really successful, does great and loves what he does. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know this from personal experience. The guy loves what he does. And now I'm not sure how old Chris is, but. 40-ish, yeah. somewhere on that range. And he, he got successful as early as probably anyone I know in illustration. Yeah. I mean, he came right out of school, which was already four years. Yeah. And he came out of school, and he started getting work with Magic and doing book covers almost right away. Yeah. And that's what he's still doing. Right. Um, and he, I mean, he was making a good living at it within a couple of years. Yeah. But again, that's... He's he, like you said. He's an outlier. You know that that's that's unusual. That's well, not it, the path most people take. I guess the reason why I'm skeptical of it is because I don't think you figure out enough about your life and who you are outside of art. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like I like again. You know, once you have the success, that neuroticism that you feel, that depression, that anxiety mm-hmm. doesn't go away. Right. You know, it's still there. And if you get work right out of the gate and expect yourself, oh, I finally did it. I'm. I, I will finally be happy. It's right. Like, I think that that's uh, a recipe for. Um, burnout, you know, recipe yeah, yeah. for not liking art. Anymore. Well, I like what Jeff did. I mean, Jeff Watts. Yeah. Um, you know, he tried just about everything in his twenties. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he started working pretty young. I don't know when Jeff first started getting work, but I want to say it was somewhere around nineteen or twenty years old. He started yeah. getting freelance yeah. illustration work, and he did storyboarding. He did movie posters. He did concept design. He did uh, um, uh, book covers. Like, I don't know if I already said book covers. He did some yeah. card illustrations. You know, he got asked to do comics. Yeah. He got asked to work at DreamWorks. He got asked to do background paintings at Disney. Yeah. Um, the guy did just about everything. And then even once he got into fine art, which I think is kind of what he always knew he wanted to do, yeah. he got into easel painting, gallery painting. But even now, even that, the way he paints now, in that kind of more like Russian influenced, very yeah. uh, boarding on abstract backgrounds with refined figures, that's completely different than how he started painting for galleries at first. At first, it was a very tight, very refined, um, uh, very reminiscent of uh, Clark Hewling's, uh, yeah. if people know, know his work, if they don't look him up. But um, very, you know, very small tiles, lots of rendering, lots of like market scenes where he's actually painting the carrots, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's. Um, but then round about probably 29, 30 years old, he kind of started finding his own voice. And that's more or less how he paints now. Right. Um, 
but it, yeah, it took him 10 years to kind of really lock down on exactly what he wanted to do. And for me, I wouldn't say it was exactly similar because I always kind of knew what I wanted to do, but I did try a lot of different stuff. Uh, you know, at, at first, you know, when I, again, when I was really young, I put together a bunch of comic book page samples and they were terrible. Um, and of course I never got any work doing it, but right. I tried really hard at it and did yeah. my best. And then I kind of shifted gears once I discovered the work of, uh, primarily, uh, Phil Hale and Glenn Orbick. Yeah. You know, the two guys that painted comic book covers and my style is, I would consider it kind of an amalgamation of those two guys with, yeah. you know, a few other people thrown in. Um, and, and from that point I started, I basically spent, I would say I was probably about 24 when I really st- discovered their work, maybe 23, somewhere in that range. And then for the next six, seven years, I started dedicating myself to trying to learn to do what they did. And it took me that long to, yeah. to do it. Right. You know, I was doing, I was doing other things. I was working in video games and doing some graphic design and, yeah. you know, teaching. Right. Um, so that slowed it down a bit, but it didn't bother me. It's like, you know, I was paying my bills and I knew I'd get there eventually, right. or I had faith that I would get there eventually. Yeah, but. yeah. Well, and I feel like the internet has made it harder for a lot of people that are more self-conscious. Oh, it's ridiculous. Because, I mean, you see it's ridiculous. the best people all the time just at the flip and, of And you see camera. the best people's best work. Yeah. Right. So if you go on, you know, I'm trying to think of a really popular illustrator right now. I mean, there's so many really good ones, but... Uh, Tyler Jacobson. Okay, Tyler Jacobson. Great, great example. You're seeing the work that Tyler wants to show you. And Tyler's great. Even Tyler's worst work is amazing. But even that, he's on his Instagram, he's showing you the best of his work. Right. You know, that's what every artist, that's what I do. You know, I I don't post my bad stuff your duds yeah. yeah or maybe i do maybe i post it once yeah but i'll post my good stuff you know over the course of a couple of years i'll post my good covers you know four or five times yeah. you know but you might see my dog bones once yeah right yeah so so yeah it's not really a fair assessment of of most people's ability like it's basically getting a greatest hits Absolutely. Well, and I think I think that's the problem with a lot of online art education is that it takes a long time. You know, it doesn't take a month. It doesn't take a year. It doesn't take t- three years. It years. takes a lifetime. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I mean, really. I mean, it's it, there. There are sort of uh, pins along the way. That's yeah. like, okay, I'm I'm a student. I'm getting better, getting better, and getting better. Okay, I'm I'm good enough to start putting together portfolio pieces. Yeah. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Oh, my portfolio is good enough to get some lower tier work. Yeah. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I'm working on the recognizable titles where I'm getting exposure just from working on stuff like Marvel or Blizzard yeah. or you know whatever. Right. You know the the top tier work. Yeah. You know you're they're giving you exposure. They're sharing your work. You're yeah. you know you're getting clout. You, right. Yeah, you're getting clout. You're the comic that you're doing a cover for isn't selling six thousand copies. It's selling fifty thousand copies or a right. hundred thousand copies. Right. Um, so a lot of people are starting to see your work and then maybe you're getting better, you're getting better. Maybe you win some awards, yeah. you know, you're getting better, you're getting better. Well, now you're the in-demand guy. You're right. the, you're the person they call first, yeah. you know? And so it's not like it's never, it seems like there are these plateaus for artists where it's like, Oh, I am now this and I am now this. It's like, no, you're just, you're just getting better. And it's what's around you has recognized you as that, yeah. but you haven't really changed. It's not like you all of a sudden took this leap, for, this huge leap forward. You just all of a sudden got recognized by another level of exposure, yeah. um, especially in today's world. It's like, you know, you might, there's some really good artists out there that even post a lot on their Instagram and just for whatever reason, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of social media, yeah. um, but there are some really good artists out there that I know that, that just are, for whatever reason, aren't in vogue. Yeah. And they have like 1,500 followers. Right. And they're brilliant. And they're brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And they've been doing it a long time. It's not, I'm not talking about like they just started up their Instagram and, you know, right. it's going to come with time. They should have a lot more followers than that. And then there's other people that have a massive following. And I don't want to, you know, I'm not putting them down, but it's like I look at their work and I go, it could be better. Yeah. You know, it should right. be better. For a million followers. Right, right. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's not bad, but it's like. Right, yeah. Yeah, relatively. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just weird. And But what, it, what that does is it gets you the, this. N- additional level of exposure yeah. and and that's really how careers work it's like the more people who see you the m- it's a numbers game yeah it's a numbers game um it's like investing you know people wonder why and i don't want to get into politics but people wonder why poor people stay poor and rich people get richer yeah. it's like well when you aren't even paying your bills you have nothing left over to take chances with yeah but when you have 
you know, $2 million, right. which even in today's world isn't really that much, but yeah. you have $2 million, you're already paying your bills. You've got funny money. Yeah. You can take chances. Right. And if you're smart, you might lose a little bit taking chances, but you're going to make a lot. Yeah. You know, you, the, the chances of you getting onto a huge stock that just takes off. Right. Um, or you can always just do it just through, you know, sheer overwhelming. You know, if yeah. you've got two million dollars, you invest two million dollars, even if you're only making two percent. Right. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it's like eighty thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that and that's why. I mean, Definitely. there's other reasons too, right. obviously, but that's a big reason why people yeah. with a lot of money can take chances, yeah. and people who don't have money, they can't take any chances. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's kind of the same way with art with art in a way it's like if you've got the skills you can take chances right you can you can take jobs on a short deadline that are going to give you great exposure but you know you're not going to do your best work but you know that you have faith that even 80 percent of your best is still going to be better than most people so you can take a gamble right if you're barely hitting deadlines on the work you're doing on comfortable deadlines you can't really take a chance and if you do you're probably going to fail and it's going to be catastrophic yeah you know you're going to miss a deadline you're going to do a bad piece you're going to make someone mad and then you and then you get even further behind right so then you're behind on your other jobs and it just starts spiraling down spiraling down but if you've got good skills you're always going to revert back to your training and if you if your 80 percent is still really really damn good like on your worst day if you're still better than most people you can gamble you can take chances you can take jobs that you probably shouldn't take right. you can pull an all-nighter and still get good work out there but someone who doesn't someone who's barely getting by as it is they pull an all-nighter and their their quality goes drops off a shelf right you know, if they take a short deadline, their quality drops off a shelf. If they're having to take, yep. you know, low-paying jobs, so then they have to do more work, right. it drops off a shelf. So it's it's all of these things. So it's very, very difficult if you don't go out there. And this goes back to what you're saying, that, that short developmental phase. Yep. If you do it in two years, even if you're good for someone, even if you're really good for someone who's been doing it two years, you've still only been doing it two years. Yeah. And that's different than someone who's been doing it for five years. So right. if I would say if there's, if I find two people that are at the same ability level and they both work hard, like all else being equal, but just one person is more gifted and they've done it in two years, I'm going to pick the guy who's been doing it for five years Yeah. because it's going to be more ingrained. It's yeah. going to be more intuitive to them. Right. You know, if you take a gifted athlete and show them how to how to shoot a jump shot, it's not going to take long before they're hitting a jump shot on a regular basis. Right. But it's not going to be intuitive. Yeah. The second something they have a hand in their face, or they're being chased around by another guy, or the game speeds up, they're going to make mistakes. And you see it at I know I use athletics as an example a lot, but it's because it's easily observed in athletics. Yeah. You see a phenomenal athlete go from college to the pros. And the game is too fast for them. Yeah. Even the best guys, the game is too fast for them for a while. Yeah. And then eventually, they speed up to the game. They catch right. up to the game, and yeah. their skills start coming out again. Right. It's very much the same way in art, only it's with deadlines. Right. Um, well, I, I, so. I've also noticed that you've diversified your income a bit. I mean, you teach and you're a cover illustrator. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, I mean, you do multiple things. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, like, and being a teacher, I love teaching. Um, I, d- I don't plan on stopping right. teaching any anytime soon, no matter... Where my career goes, um, I may do it less at some point, but I always want to teach because I love it. But one of the reasons I've done as much as I have is that it's allowed me to stay in school. It's yeah. allowed me to be a student for 20 years yeah. or 25 years. Right. As long as I've been at the school, I've been a student. Even though I'm teaching, yeah. it's still allowing me to... At this point, the, the fundamentals are so intuitive to me yeah. that... I don't even have to think about it. Yeah. And that's where I've always wanted to get to. Right. It's like if when I sit down to draw a head, I don't want to have to think about having to draw a head. Yeah. I want to be thinking about the other things. You know, how am I tilting that head to best tell the story? Right. What expression is this person having uh, to, to best tell the story? What's the lighting? It's like that's the kind of stuff I want to weigh my options and yeah. put my options into play. I don't want to have to think about it's like, you know, it's like, oh, my, the axis of my eyes is off. Right. It still is sometimes, but, you know, it's... Everybody has their bad days, yeah. but it's not something that takes up the majority of my thought anymore. Yeah. Right. Now it's the other things. Now it's the more subjective things. What yeah. do I want to say with this? Right. What role is this person playing in the scene that I'm trying to put together? Yeah, yeah, right. When I was talking to Morgan about this, and he was on my podcast before. Yeah, I saw that. Talking about how, like, it, it, like, art is just fundamentally a communication device. Yeah. Uh, like, it just, it's like talking, mm-hmm. right? Or, yeah, dancing, playing music, whatever, yeah. right? 
and it's like, um, you know, uh, you know, I equate learning draftsmanship to punctuation, right? It's mm-hmm. like learning what an independent clause is and a semicolon and all that kind of stuff. Right, right. It's, it's all essentially the same thing. And you learn the fundamentals just to, again, have the confidence right. in saying the things. The difference being is that you don't have to, not that you don't have to practice grammar, yeah. but it's like once you understand the rules of grammar, you understand the rules of grammar. You can understand the rules of art and you still have to go and practice it for right. a year yeah. to be able to do it. Right. So even though you might understand how edges work, you might understand how values work, you might understand how structure works, you might understand how gesture works, that's not enough. Yeah. Just understanding right. it is, an, is not enough. Yeah. You have to be able to go and do it almost like breathing. Well, and I remember us talking about how like you know, one hour of class time could be like a thousand hours of study, right? It's like you can explain gesture or edges in ten minutes, right? Mm-hmm. It's not that complicated, right? But to understand them intuitively to it to like a masterful level, it takes a lifetime, right? You know, and I think that's the problem that a lot of people run into with art is they watch a tutorial online and they have an objective understanding of color or perspective or any of that kind of stuff, and then they don't, and then they can't draw well. Yeah, you know? well, it's actually a phenomenon that they've studied. Yeah, that that is a problem with modern society is that people go and watch a YouTube video and think they know how to do something right. like they actually will watch a video on how to you know rebuild a car engine and something in our brains clicks and we actually think we know how to rebuild a car engine right. because yeah we know the steps we know the but if you've never if you haven't rebuilt a car engine 10 times you yeah. don't know how to rebuild a car engine. yeah yeah it's really complicated and, it's like, and yeah. you actually might hurt somebody so. yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. And, and it's actually a a a studyable phenomenon right. right now is that it's actually really a problem that yeah. people think they know things that they really don't know just because they saw someone do it on a YouTube video. Right, right. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I guess going back to the, uh, like, intuitive and saying the things you want to say, that goes back to the caveman stuff, I think. Mm-hmm. It goes back to, like, what do you really think about when you're just, you know, like, just trying to have fun? Like, yeah, are you, yeah, absolutely. Are you trying to animate stuff? Are you trying to make comic books? Are you trying to make fine art? Like, what what is it what is the primal thing inside of you that you have to say? You know? Right, right, yeah, yeah, and that's and that's for that's for everyone. Um, I, for me personally, it's a lot of it's modern mythology. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah, I gravitate towards uh, superheroes, but I also love um, any kind of uh, genre. You know, I, I like genre fiction. You know, I like I like horror movies. I like sci-fi. I like fantasy. I like superheroes. You know, I like all this stuff because it's kind of our modern mythology. It's our modern gods not to you know uh, dismiss religion or someone's belief system but religion used to be or not so much religion whatever um, gods used to be something more than that to right. people it wasn't just about your faith or how you identified they were also the stories that they told and it was it was a form of entertainment as well absolutely I um, totally agree and now we've sort of separated the two there's there's people how they self-identify and what religion they identify with and they take it very very seriously um, which is their right to do so yep. but then we've yep. sort of separated out fiction and entertainment from that we don't really blur the line between them as much as I think they did yeah. in the past like most of the, f- the 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 first great stories were for lack of a better term Cain and Abel you yeah, know, yeah yeah David or, Goliath yeah right? yeah, so, yeah or going yeah. back even you know even even further than those stories yeah. I mean and those go back a long time I mean right. you go back and those are the first stories they didn't really draw a line between fiction and faith yeah the, right. the way that we do now yeah I don't even think right. they really thought of it that way yeah well I, I think it's I mean the way I see people hanging up Marvel posters on their walls or the way people will go to movies the way people mm-hmm. you know I mean people have traveled across the planet to study with you you know mm-hmm. And I think, to me, that's the same psychological, you know, phenomenon as somebody going to Mecca from right, right. You know, making a pilgrimage to Mecca to get some yeah. for like knowledge. That, you know, some in, in a way, a great art school should be an art Mecca. Yeah. It should be. It should draw people from all over the world because right. if you're good at it, people should want to come and learn from you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm personally not putting myself on that on that level, but yeah. but people do come from around the world to study at our school. Yeah. Um, and it's a really interesting thing, and it's very flattering yeah. that, that that someone might think that it's worth relocating from Germany or Poland or yeah. England or Australia or whatever to come and move to a tiny little Shout out to Phil. surfer town. Shout you know? out to Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it's it's. It, it's it's yeah it's it's really interesting it's yeah yeah absolutely and I think it's like you know again uh, 
you know, all these people that are doing it, they know that art is going to take a long time to do. You know, yeah. it's, it's it's not a quick thing. You know, it's not like they're going there and learning the Riley method from you, and then right. they have enough to, you know, it's like, um, you know, it, it, I really think it is uh, very similar to all the old biblical stories or stories from the Quran, or they're very similar to Batman as well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's 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 a common mythology. Yeah. I mean, you know, Joseph Campbell breaks it down better than anyone. Yeah. I mean, he. he he basically sees all the commonalities and the things that why do we like essentially the same story told over and over again. So it's like it's in our DNA. It's yeah. a story that's been told to us for right. millennia. Um, Absolutely. But it also goes back to you know, the Internet. Well, I, th- I think it's simultaneously probably the, the best and worst thing that's ever happened to artists and maybe even just society. Yeah. Because now if you want to study a certain kind of artwork – you go online, you find some place that teaches that certain kind of artwork, and you can go and study there. Yeah. When I was young, it, it was very difficult to find what you were looking for. Yeah. I'm sure there were still places. In fact, I know there were still places out there teaching it because Jeff went to one of those places, and yeah. his dad had heard about it from another artist. Yeah. But like the school that Jeff went to, there was literally no way to find out about that school. Yeah. Unless you just happen to stumble upon it, right. and even when I went to, when I started going to Watts, it was the same way. It's like I went to community college, and I was taking art classes, and another guy there saw me drawing out a Bridgman, yeah. and said, "Oh man, you should come down and check out this school." But it was yeah. just pure happenstance, and that's where the luck comes in, right? Yeah. It's like right. I just happened to find the school. Yeah, you were in Southern California. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. If, yeah. if if I had been in Iowa, right? There's probably nothing like that. I mean, maybe there is now, but back then, back in the 90s, the early 90s, right. there probably wasn't anything like this in in most of the world. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, now there's obviously varying degrees of quality, but there's there's schools. There's enough. Right? Yeah, that are that are influenced by, you know, our our art movement. Right. That they're everywhere. Yeah. You know, we've trained people and they go back home and they start up teaching class. Maybe it's not a school, but they teach some classes. Yeah. You know, it's and then if if not that, you go on the internet. I mean, we literally have an online school now, right. and so it's great. So someone who is trying to learn, you know, how to draw in Singapore, right. you know, can, yeah, can yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, they can do you know, it. they right. can they can find a path to getting out here and study for even if it's for just a brief period, or they can study online. Absolutely. Um, but at the same time, then you know, like we were talking about, it's like there's also a, this illusion that oh, I watch a video and I know how to do it, right. or I get discouraged because of how many good people are out there. Yeah. Um, and those people are getting better too because they have access to everything else. Everything else, and people who are better than them. Like one of the first things I did when when email started becoming a thing is I emailed Donato Giancola. Yeah. It's like you know when I was putting together my portfolio, it's like, hey Donato, can I get your input on? He was nice enough to yeah. have me give him a call, and we talked on the phone. He didn't know who I was. Yeah. It's like, but you have access to that. Whereas, you know, thirty years ago, yeah. that wouldn't have been a thing. You would have had to go to you a convention or yeah. something. You know, it's. Right. And not everyone has those kind of resources. But yeah. now, it's like you have an email. Yeah. Someone can email me and ask a question if, right. if they aspire to do what I do. Right. You know? Um, I remember when, uh, when I wrote uh, a senior uh, project. I can't remember exactly what it was for, but it was basically it was for one of the classes, and the teacher had us write a senior project about what we wanted to do for a living. And... I knew I wanted to be an artist, but I had no way of getting in touch with a comic artist. Yeah. But one of the other things I thought about doing was working in special effects. And so I literally started looking through the yellow pages for people who did special effects. And I actually yeah. found a couple places. Right. And I called them up and got some very discouraging <laughs> comments from them. Yeah. Um, where they're basically, you know, because it was at the time that, you know, Jurassic Park and stuff like that was coming yeah. out. And you know, practical effects people were like... Dude, in five years, this isn't even going to be a job. Yeah. You know, thankfully they were wrong, yeah. but but at the time it was looking really grim for practical effects people. Yeah. But I still, you know, I wrote a whole report on it, and yeah. I, I learned a lot, and um, you know, I ended up going in the direction that I did, which was good. But it was something else I thought about doing. Yeah. But I literally had to just comb through the yellow pages and hope that I found something. Again, fortunately, I lived in Southern California, right? So you know, there's right. you know. Well, I find I find that most people living in the modern world have those opportunities available to them even if 
uh, they don't think they do. Even right. somebody that's listening to this podcast right, right. does think now. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right the second. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, now right, now yeah, you have yeah. access to everything you could ever possibly need to pursue your dreams. Right. All you need is the is the personal resources. You yeah. need you know the funds or the wherewithal or the cleverness or the or the planning yeah. to make it a reality. But you have access to all of these things. Yeah. That's what, but that was my point. That's like before the internet, you really didn't right you had to take some major risks yeah you know to to do it like you would have to move to some place like chicago or new york or california yeah to have those opportunities to even have a chance yeah to even have a chance right, right. yeah there wasn't that many places where artists worked yeah in in the country now artists work everywhere yeah you know, I, I know I know guys that live out in the boonies, yeah. and they you know they photograph their stuff and they or they just work digitally and they send it in over the internet. Yeah. Um, so again, it's it's one of the greatest tools and one of the greatest yeah. problems. Do, do you think anyone that is listening to this podcast has the tools available to them to to do what you're saying? I think everybody who's who's yeah, watching yeah. this has yeah, yeah. has the yeah, tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I I don't. I again, it's to 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 greater and lesser degrees. Yeah. But literally, like Proco. Yeah. It's like how many hours of videos does Proco have for free? Yeah. So literally, all you need is the internet. So I would say, as long as you have the internet, the. Again, it's not as prevalent as it probably should be. And again, I'm not going to get into right. politics about yeah. it. But, yeah. but if you have the internet. You can pursue your dreams. Yeah. Are you a communist, Eric? Or? I am, no, 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 no. I, I am, I am, I am very much a capitalist. But I think when it comes to uh, to the infrastructure of education, I think that our country invests way less than it should. I agree. I agree. With that. Um, I, I think that anything that makes people more informed, more educated, um, and have access to information, I think in the long run, uh, you know, in the short run, I think sometimes it can be tough yeah you know people who grew up without it you know right. people who lived into their adulthood without it um it's it's a tough tool to wrap your brain around yeah. um like even me it's like i don't use it as intuitively or as naturally as someone your age yeah. um it's it, you grew up with the internet right. you've never known a world without the internet yeah. um so it's just second nature to you it's right. just it's always been there and you process the information much much better than someone like i do let alone someone who's 70 or 80 years yeah. old right. um but again, all that aside, um, I just I wish that we would invest more money in, in the infrastructure of education. Yeah. Um, getting people, uh, students, uh, access to computers and tablets and the internet and books and all that stuff. We sh- I, personally, I think we should spare no expense in that. Um, I, I think that it's going to leave us uh, falling behind if we don't if we don't get that worked out. Um, but I, I, that being said, that's true. Yeah. But the great thing is that we, because of how great capitalism is, yeah. it allows people like Jeff to do it for them. If our country isn't going to do it, well, right. then there's a hole in the market there, yeah. and Jeff can start that up. I think that that's somewhat unique to art. Yeah. Like I can't imagine someone starting up like an online independent medical school. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it maybe, maybe at some point, maybe yeah. at some point, I think that would be very difficult to police. Yeah, art. If you know, if you teach someone to draw badly, right. what happens? Right. You know, you teach someone to, you know, provide health care poorly. <laughs> Brain and, surgery. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be a tough yeah. one, but I, I think it would be great. Yeah, I think absolutely. if if someone can figure it out at some point, that that would be yeah. that would be great because we have such a, a shortage of healthcare service providers in this country. Well, I think a lot of even health is, is based or like you can learn the basics of health and probably get 90% of the way there just in special cases. Sure. Know, the outliers, people with cancer, you know, all that stuff. But, you know, learning to eat well, learning to exercise, oh, absolutely. you know, all that stuff is very accessible. In the oh yeah, absolutely. You know? um, but you have to, but you have to, it's, it's difficult to know what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, there's absolutely. a lot, the problem is there's a lot of information out there and, and most of it is wrong. Right. But with art, it's very clear. If you get good information in very short period of time, you will draw better. Absolutely. If you don't get good information, you will not draw better. Yeah. Um, with with health, sometimes there's things that can provide short term positive effects that in the long term are bad for you. Yeah. Um, um, and and conversely, sometimes things that seem not to do much in the short term, yeah. you'll see, you'll reap the benefits of it in two years, five years, ten years. Right. You know, or you might not ever notice it, yeah. but you'll notice it when you're old and right. you can still take a poop. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, you can still walk. So, you know? Yeah, right. yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. So. Yeah, well, I think the job of a teacher now is not to 
for the ride information. It's to keep people, you know, again, to, to provide that like coaching. A lot of it. Know. A lot of it is, is just, it, it is to provide information, but you're right. You can get that from a lot of places. You want to learn perspective. You can get perspective out of a book. Yeah. You want to learn composition. You can get composition out of a book. It's to provide little nudges in the right de- direction. It's to provide examples, both spiritually or psychologically and physically. Yeah. Um, and it's also to keep people inspired. Yeah. If you keep someone doing something, they're going to get good at it. Yeah. And again, it goes back to, you know, thinking you're not good at something when you do something for a living. Right. It's like, if you go and you do something for six to 10 hours, five to six days a week, if you're not good at that, Right. There's something wrong. There's something weird going on. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you're not good at it for people who do that job. Yeah. But you're going to just through sheer volume, you're going to get good at it. Yeah, yeah. Good enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or at least efficient, if not good, efficient. And sometimes efficiency is what it's about, too. Being able to just churn through a lot of volume. Well, and I I think part of the reason people become obsessed with the upper echelon of skill is because I think our culture worships fame and money. Sure. It's like everyone knows who Bill Gates is. Right. Which is, you know... But how many people know if Bill Gates is actually good at what he does? Very few. I'm sure he is. Or at least I'm sure he was at one time. He's not the best, for sure. Yeah. You know, he probably has programmers that are 100... I I doubt he even is involved with much of that stuff anymore. Yeah, probably not at all. So, so yeah, I'm sure at one time he was very, very good at what he did. Yeah. But, But, yeah, it's... Exceptionalism is not parallel to financial success. Yeah. In fact, very often I find that it's the other way around. That the people who are interested in becoming, probably with the exception of sports, yeah. people who are most involved in becoming exceptional at something, they're not doing the other little things that lead to financial success. Yeah. They're not. They're not promoting themselves. Right. They're not getting out there. They're not. They're not pushing because they don't care. They just care about being good. Right. And they're like. Now look, I'm getting better. I'm right. paying my bills. That's, that's what I care about. Yeah. It's like right. I care about getting good. That's my currency. That's, that's what I can do. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like where there, there's yeah. other people, it's like they're the other way around. They care about just getting good enough so that once their promotional skills come into play, right. they have great financial success. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people hate me for saying this, but Steve Jobs. Yeah. Steve Jobs couldn't do anything. Yeah. I mean, he was just he was a he was a very Good. Creative mind, very brilliant marketing, and a, and a yeah. brilliant marketer. Yeah, that's what he was good at. He was brilliant at marketing. Yeah, um, that, he's that's that's why, you know, Apple is what it is. Yeah. It's it, Apple doesn't make better computers. Right. I mean, some things they do better than anyone else, but but mostly they just convince everybody that they do things yeah. by making things look cool. Yeah, they make things look like the future. Right. So of course you want to own it. Yeah. It's like yeah. oh, my futuristic yeah. thing yeah. looks yeah. futuristic. Yeah. 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 It's like if you if you make a microphone look like that, it's going to have a lot better chance of selling than if you make it look like you know a rock. And, yeah. Right. Exactly. Like a rock. Right. Yeah. Or just you know just a thing sitting you know look, make it look like a yeah, coaster yeah, like have the, the the chips and everything i don't know what goes into a microphone right right but like but yeah everything is exposed right right yeah so if it, it's again it's about branding if you make something look like a really cool version of what it does you know yeah. and, and that goes into everything if someone looks like a movie star they're gonna have a way better chance of becoming a movie star right you know if they dress like a movie star there's there's no mystery behind the fact that when actors become successful all of a sudden they have a movie star hairdo yeah. and movie star clothing is because they're branding themselves as a movie star. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, or a rock star or, yeah. or what are those people don't look like that? I've seen the yeah. dudes from Blink-182 walking around town. Right. They don't, they look like dudes. dads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. They, I see them literally with their kid yeah, in yeah. a shopping cart. They, other right. than the tats, they look like dads. Right. You know, so, yeah, yeah it's, it, but that, that's not how you market yourself, you know. I guarantee you that Steven Tyler doesn't look like Steven Tyler when he's hanging out with his family. No, no. So, yeah. yeah so, yeah, it's, it's about branding. And, and that's what you see with artists, too. You know, there's artists that, you know, they make themselves look like artists. Right. Because it's it's good. You know, yeah. you get people thinking that you're artistic and right. you're going to be more successful as an artist. But then there's other guys that, that don't and they don't care. Yeah, right. Well, again, a big part of it is just what you want. You know? Yeah. I think it goes back to, like, I think there's a reality of being a professional artist that fundamentally at the end of the day it's about money you mm-hmm. know it's like you're being hired for a job right right for somebody to put on a product sure. to sell to people you know? it's always about capitalism to a certain degree it has yeah, to yeah. be absolutely and I, I think that looking at 
illustration from a purely romantic point of view is a mistake, you know? At, at least from my perspective, you know? Again, it, it depends on what your goals are. Yeah. If, if, you're, if you're willing to flex enough to pay your bills, and what you want to do is make great artwork so that 50 years from now people are still looking at your artwork, then awesome. Yeah. yeah. But if you want to be really successful today, right now, and you know, make a bunch of money. Yeah, you're going to have to market yourself to the here and now. Right. You're going to have to look like what people today think an artist looks like. You're going to have to do artwork that not just is great artwork, but that fulfills the requirement of the client. And that's what illustration is all about. Illustration is not really about doing great artwork, not in the short term. Yeah. Like this job that you're working on right now, that job has certain requirements and it's not just making great artwork. Right. It's also about selling to a certain dem demographic. It's about communicating a certain thing to the people who buy those products. So if you do a book cover, your book cover can't just be a cool image. It has to tell the buyer, the reader, what that book is about. What type of book is this? So if you're doing a book and you want to appeal to the Harry Potter market, guess what? The client's probably going to want the cover to look like a Harry Potter cover. You know, if, if it's if it's you know if it's appealing to the you know uh, Star Wars demographic, it's right. you're gonna want it to look like Drew Struzan. Yeah. You know, it's it it's you know I mean that's obviously gross gross oversimplification, but it's true that immediately communicates to the viewer. In fact, there's there's no wonder that companies will hire you know we're hiring Drew Struzan for a while because yeah. it communicated to people, hey, look at our project. It's like Star Wars. Right. If you like Star Wars, ours is like Star Wars. It might yeah. not even be like Star Wars, but right. that's what they're trying to tell people. Absolutely, yeah. And it, it comes it comes out of the marketing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I, I guess it's like um, there there is artistry in professional illustration, like like oh, yeah, yeah. you know, Rockwell. You know, absolutely. You know, absolutely. But at the same time, it's like you know you are on a limited time frame. Sure. And it is. Um, you know, it, it's it's a lot um, messier than. I guess the romantic, the pure romantic idea. Of it is, it is and it isn't. Um, here, here, here's to me my perception of it. It's like you kind of have you have multiple choices, but I'm going to simplify it down into two choices. You can play in the sandbox that's already been created, yeah. or you can create a new sandbox. Yeah. So you can use the vocabulary that's already been established. If you do work like Drew Struzan, you're going to get hired to do work that tells people that this project is like Star Wars. Yeah. This project is like Indiana Jones. You're going to be getting that kind of work. But you know what Drew Struzan did? Drew Struzan became Drew Struzan, yeah. and he created a new visual language, or at least a variation, yeah. you know, a, an identifiable variation. And all of a sudden, his brand became a market in and of itself. They started hiring him to do, to create, to communicate something to certain people. Right. It's like they don't want, they didn't, now they would want someone to be like Drew Struzan. Right. Well, Drew Struzan was Drew Struzan. Of yeah. course, when he started out, his work was like other people. Yeah. But, you know, Frazetta, you know, Frazetta created a, a new thing. Uh, Chris Ron created a new thing. Uh, Dan Dos Santos created a new thing. I mean, yeah, it was, it's not completely wholesale original, but their work is very, very, very identifiable. Bill Sienkiewicz, there's a great example, right? Yeah. Bill Sienkiewicz, he started out drawing a lot like Neil Adams, yeah. and he was very successful and got, I mean, <laughs> he might laugh at that, but he had success yeah. at a very young age. He had success and he did well. But not too long after that, he, you started seeing this new thing emerge. Yeah. And he became, started becoming what we think of as Bill Sienkiewicz now. Yeah. And it created this whole new idea. It almost created a subgenre within comic books. Yeah. He became, it became like the painted graphic novel guy. Yeah. And there were other guys who started coming in and doing kind of what yeah. He did, yeah. um, and and it was really interesting. You started seeing comics like like Meltdown come out from Marvel, and right. you've got you know Arkham Asylum and all this this whole sort of subgenre of the of the edgy independent mainstream, yeah. um, and that's what it communicated to people. All of a sudden, you have this sort of Bill Sienkiewicz look right. to your comic, and people think, oh, this isn't your daddy's Batman. Yeah, this is right. this is a new thing. Yeah. Whereas then you hire you know. Neil Adams, right. and this is your daddy's Batman. Yeah. You know, it's like this is, in, they pick a good art director is going to pick artists like that for a very specific thing. Right. And it's always difficult when you're telling, when you'll see an artist 
an aspiring artist with a portfolio and it's unique and you look at it and they're asking, asking you, what can I do to get work? And it almost breaks your heart because yeah. you're like, well, if you need to get work tomorrow, yeah. like if, if, if you're on your last box of Top Ramen, yeah. you need to get more mainstream. Yeah. You need to do stuff that now you need to do stuff that looks like Chris Ron. Yeah. It's like, and it breaks your heart. Because Chris Ron is already Chris Ron. I don't yeah. need more Chris Ron. I need someone who's going to be the next right. Chris Ron. Yeah. And I'm looking at their work, and I and I tell them, it's like, it's like, well, that you're you're just not going to get a lot of work right now, right? Because it's a risk. Yeah. And you're not a known commodity. Your work is different, and art directors don't want to hire something that's different because if it doesn't go well, the art director is going to be the one who's going to be to blame. Yeah. Right. Now, granted, if they hire it and it goes well, well, that art director just had a hand in you know, giving birth to one yeah. of the best good young artists. Yeah. So they don't get the credit if it goes well, right. but they get the blame if it yeah, doesn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so the, it's, it's, they're really, art directors can be very risk yeah. averse. Yeah. So you uh, need that project. So you kind of need to have that, that, that stick to itiveness right. to have that breakout project. And then once they see, it's like, Oh, people like this. Right. Uh, my buddy, Jeremy Wilson would be a great example of that. Yeah. Um, he, when he first showed me his work, and this was before he, you know, before he was really doing much work, he was young. I don't know how young. He was probably 20, 21 years old, something like that, maybe younger. And he showed me his work, and I told him exactly that. I said, it's going to be very difficult to convince art directors to hire you because your work is different. But now here he is, you know, years later, yeah. and he's crushing it. Yeah. You know, it's 10 years later, and he's, and he's in demand. He's doing great, but it took him a long time right. for people to finally grasp on that's like oh this is good work yeah not just oh it's different which is what they focus on at first but this is good and different yeah um and now he's doing great yeah you know doing doing phenomenal right um but it takes all that that's a much longer road to go which is why most artists start out looking like someone else i mean bill yeah. sinkevich started out looking like you know uh neil adams everyone does. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah most people i wouldn't say necessarily yeah. everyone but most people um frazetta even started out looking like you know, uh, Alan St. John or, uh, or line, or I mean, uh, Wyeth or, yeah. you know, they, there were a lot of influence there. So you look at different pieces and you look like yeah. different people. Right. Um, and you can look at almost everyone, Jeffrey Jones, you know, first looked just like Frazetta. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, yeah, even Wrightson's early stuff looked like Frazetta's inks. Yeah. It's, you know, almost everyone looks like someone else when they first start. Right. And then they start to find their own, own voice. Even even Boris, when he first started, his stuff looked a lot like Frazetta's. Yeah. And then he became Boris. And then there was the Boris clones. And those Boris clones started looking like themselves eventually. Right. So, yeah, I mean, if you're the, that first work you get is usually someone's going to hire you to be someone else. Yeah, right. Um, or m- more and more now, it's it's a brand. You know, like yeah. Blizzard has a look, and right. you're going to get hired to paint the Blizzard look. Yeah. Um, so now it's almost not even so much other artists. Now it's just the look. Yeah. It's like, hey, this is what our stuff looks like. You know, Warhammer has a certain look. Right. Blizzard has a certain look. Even for a while, Magic the Gathering was getting to have, like, a look. Right. Um, and now they've diversified, which I think was really wise. Yeah. Um, so, um, but, but yeah. But, but, but you don't get there without, you know, first doing the, you know, uh, the first work, right? Like you right. need you need to look like somebody else, right? So you either have to go two ways. You know, you either you either make your work look more marketable, right. i.e., like another successful artist, or you stick with it and wait right. for your chance. Absolutely. And I, I feel, you know, when I talk to professional artists, talk trying to give advice to younger students about how to how to become professional artists, it's it's never linear. It's always yeah. like it's yeah. it always depends case by case. There's no exact advice anyone can give you that will be the exact thing you should do to become a professional right because artist. you can't predict opportunity yeah right you yeah. you can you can predict skill level you know I, I can look at your work and say oh man in two years you're going to be really good if you keep doing it yeah. in two years i can see what you're going to be and it's and it's something special yeah. but you can't predict opportunity right you know you you don't know when the right art director is going to come along at the right time, and you just happen to show them your. Por- There's just too many things that have to align, yeah. and you and you can't ever predict that. And that's why my advice is always get your work in fr- in front of as many people as you possibly can. Yeah. And that's one of the nice again great thing about the internet, yeah. easy way to get your work in front of. But because everyone can do that, it gets drowned out a little bit. Absolutely. Well, and I, I guess again going back to there's no linear way of doing it. It's like I know plenty of people who've done you know textbook illustration for a long time before they even started sure. getting 
you know, work as illustrators in magic or something, right. you know, it's like there, there is like, you know, maybe you doing some favor for somebody else's webcomic or something leads mm -hmm. to you having your dream job at some point, right. you know, it's com like completely well, arbitrary. And there's also such a thing as critical mass, which yeah. again is, is why it's so important to get your work in front of, in front of as many people. I always wanted to do my, my dream was to always do comic covers and specifically uh, Marvel comic covers. Yeah. That was kind of, that was, if you ask me what my dream job was, and I can even break it down further than that, but let's just say Marvel comic book covers. And I'd been trying to do that forever. And I had literally gotten work with everybody else. And when I say everybody else, I mean literally everyone else I wanted to work for. I'd worked for Tor. I'd worked for Blizzard. I'd worked for Wizards of the Coast. I had worked on Magic the Gathering. I'd worked, I'd done covers for DC Comics. I'd done covers for Dark Horse Comics. I'd done covers for Boom Comics. Yeah. The one company I wanted to work for, right. and it was the one cover I wasn't getting, it was the one work I wasn't getting offered to me. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, um, I, I got to be friends with, uh, with Tyler Walpole, another yeah. illustrator, and he had the contact information of the talent relations manager at Marvel. Yeah. You came in and started taking classes, and your dad became the publisher at <laughs> yeah, Marvel. Right. Um, and then there was one other thing, too. I can't remember what. I think a friend of mine started working for Marvel at the same time. Yeah. And like, literally, all three of those things happened like within a year. Right. And so all of a sudden, you couldn't not see my work if you worked yeah. for Marvel. I yeah. was I was right. getting my work shown through you and your dad. I was getting yes. my work shown through uh, through uh, Ricky, the talent relations yeah. manager at right. Marvel. I was getting my work shown through other artists that I knew that worked there. Yeah. Um, and and so just all of a sudden it was like if I did, if I wasn't getting work at Marvel, I just wasn't good enough. Yeah. Right. And, and that's what it came to. The opportunity was, was was there. The exposure was there, and the critical mass was there. Right. They were probably eventually going to give me work just to freaking stop hearing about how they should give me work. <laughs> just to shut you up. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. kind of, you know, like what Todd McFarlane said, he would send out packages to every editor at Marvel every month. And he said he, he was convinced eventually they hired him just so they only got one package a month from him rather than 50. Yeah. Right. Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to, to cut down on postage. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and that, I mean, that's, it's a joke, but, but there, there's some truth to that, not in the way that he's saying, but you know, if, they see your work enough, there's a weird thing that happens. That's why submit to the annuals, submit right. to the competitions, have a web page, have an Instagram, have a Facebook, have a Twitter, have a, you know, whatever, everything, whatever, whatever the new thing is, you know, get all of that out there because eventually if, if your work is good and someone sees it enough time, they're going to convince themselves that you should be working for them. Right. Well, and I think this is like, you know, all of this said, I don't know if this is something I would recommend somebody do, even. You know, because there's so much reject... I mean, like, like, this is all given that they want to be a professional illustrator. Sure. Right? It's like, you know, when I look at all this stuff, there's so much rejection and sure. uh, struggle involved in that process that it might not even be worth it for somebody to even go through all those steps. The, you know? the truth is, make sure it's what you want to do. Yeah. Make sure you want to be an artist. Make sure you don't want to be called an artist. Make sure right. you don't want to be treated. Make sure you don't want to Just identify as right. an artist. Yeah. Make sure that you actually want to make artwork. Right. You want to sit in a room in a dark room with an easel yeah. and just paint pictures, yeah. right? Because if you That's do, what it is, it's worth it. Yeah, right, absolutely. But if, if you don't, it is not worth it. Yeah. Right. There there are better ways to, to go about what you're looking for, which is is an identity. Yeah. Absolutely. There there are much better ways to go about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, art I don't know, it's difficult for me. It's 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 tough to say. I wouldn't ever want to tell anyone not to do it. But I also think that anything worth doing is gonna come with its fair share of pain. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, self improvement is painful. Yeah. You know, improving your spirituality your spirituality, meaning your your understanding of who you are and how you relate to the world around you. That would be my definition of spirituality. That's painful. You know, getting in shape, that's right. painful. Yeah. You know, uh, re well, more than just physically too. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh studying, meaning, uh, reading and, and, and being critic, engaging in critical thought and, and, and analyzing information. That's painful. Yeah. These are all difficult things to do. Being in a relationship, yeah. painful. All of these things are painful things to do, but they lead you to being, I think a right. better person. Yeah. Um, so with with art, yeah, it's gonna come with its fair share of pain. But if it's what you really want to do, it's it's totally worth it. My number one piece of advice, and I am terrible about following this piece of advice. My number one piece of advice to anyone who wants to be an artist and have a happy long career, 
separate your self self worth from the quality of your artwork. Yeah. Being a good artist does not make you a good person. Yeah. And being a good person is not going to make you a good artist. Those two things have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. So when you do a bad piece of artwork, you did a bad piece of artwork. That's it. Yeah. End of story. That's all. It's not fun. Yeah. Any more than losing at a sports competition is right. fun. It's it's horrible. Yeah. But it matters. Right. I mean, it's a lot of people get bent out of shape. Winning matters. Yeah. It does, and that's why it's painful to lose. Yeah, yeah. Because it matters. It but yeah. detach your self worth from that. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with the quality of person right. you are. I've known a lot of wonderful people that rarely win. Yeah. In fact, one of the reasons they rarely win is because they're wonderful people. Yeah. They sacrifice constantly to give other people chances. Yeah. And on the other side, I know immensely successful people that win all the time. They're freaking horrible human beings. Yeah. So it, the two things, I don't understand why people... I mean, I do understand because I do it all the time. I have... I you certainly, can help it, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think you can help it, but it's difficult. Yeah, It's yeah. difficult. Well, you know, I found that there are people that have achieved both. It's like they, they are successful and Absolutely. they are great artists. Like I said, the, the two things are completely yeah. disconnected. Right. You know, you can be a, a really good person and be really successful. Well, and I, I you think can, that, you know, well, my, my personal opinion is, that, you know, the shorter amount of time that you give yourself to find yourself the higher the chances that you're going to be somebody who's out of balance with you know who like who you are with that happy i would say generally speaking compressing the time frame of anything makes it much more dangerous yeah right. much more dangerous yeah, yeah. I, I think there is the more time you give yourself to develop and grow within reason yeah within yeah. reason you can start to use that as an excuse for not doing things it's like oh well i'm you know, gestating. I'm compressing. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. like you know, it's like well, yeah. fuck you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes, <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but to, you know, to each their own their own path. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a difficult balancing act to know when to push and when to pull back. Yeah, is yeah. is is very very difficult. Absolutely. Um, especially as an artist, especially as a professional artist, because when you're when you've got work you're stressed over deadlines. Yeah. When you don't have work, you're stressed over not having work. Yeah. And so you never have those relaxation periods. So it's difficult to, to go with the flow, do the work when it's there yeah. and pull back and study when it's not, Yeah. Right. Um, you know, work on yourself, yeah. you know, when, when, but you know, but then you still have to find more work obviously. Right. But if you're good, the work will come to you. Absolutely. Well, and I, 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 you know, I was talking to Morgan about this too. Um, he said that uh, if he had, if he didn't have to worry about money, he'd become a worse artist. You know, um, and I think what he means by that is that at a certain point, there is an external pressure there sure. that does force you. You, you no need to what. leverage yourself. That's right. true. Yeah. The reason I, I paused is because not often, but a few times I've talked to Morgan. I wouldn't say I know him, but I've talked to him and I've heard stories about him. <laughs> Morgan, you're full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not money that motivates that guy. No, no, he's he's a great artist. Yeah, yeah. if 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 yeah. he didn't have to make money, he said he'd revisit painting eventually. Yes. Yeah. 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 There would be a time. Sure. Yeah. Anyone who who does anything intensely. When they get the chance to take a break, they take a break. Yeah. Um, not anyone. Most people. <laughs> I would have that, by the way. Most people. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's not my, it's not the the desire for money or things that oh, makes Morgan absolutely. a great artist. No, I, I, again, I guess what I meant by it's not money. It, again, it's it's like the um, like uh, you know having a value of your work that you know it means more. If, you sure. Can, yeah. If you yeah, get yeah. the money, right? Uh, yeah, like, certainly. A, yeah. A, a, external. Yeah, it does. It does play a role. Absolutely. Sure. It it, yeah. it absolutely does. Yeah. When someone wants to pay you, you know, twenty thousand dollars for a painting, yeah. it it feels good, yeah. and it and it and it also, for me, it makes you not want to let people down. Yeah. I always tell people the hard painting isn't the one that you get paid six figures for. Right. The hard painting is the next one. Yeah. Because the one that you got paid six figures for, that wasn't a six figure painting. Right. That was whatever you had sold a painting for before that. Right. But then all of a sudden you make you know a hundred thousand dollars on a painting. Yeah. And the next one has to be a hundred thousand dollar painting because you now expect that of yourself, and yeah. you know that someone else is probably going to pay that, yeah. and you want them to feel like they're getting their money's worth. 
Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly that aspect of it. Right. There's, there's, there's exchange of value, yeah. right? You know, and someone has now said that your work is worth that. And so it drives you to make your work yeah. worth that, even if you don't need the money. Right. Um, you know, like there was a certain point that, that, uh, Howard Turpening didn't need to make any more money, yeah. but the dude was still pouring everything he had at like 80 some odd years old, yeah. pouring everything he had into his paintings yeah. because people were paying, going to pay an obscene amount of money for those paintings, no matter what. Right. Cause well, it, it, you know, again, it's not about like the money is just one for like, it's somebody, it's, it's a metric. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's a metric. Yeah, yeah right. absolutely. Absolutely. Just like sales are a metric. You know, you get hired to do covers for Batman. Yeah. Batman's going to sell well, no matter right. who's drawing it or who's writing it. It's Batman. Yeah. X-Men yeah. is going to sell well, no matter who's drawing it. Who. So once you get, so once you're the guy who's hired to do that, you want to make sure that, you're worth it. Absolutely. You yeah. you want to make sure getting the chance is one thing. Earning it comes afterwards. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, someone gives you the opportunity. They're like, hey, we're going to give you this shot to direct a Star Wars movie or a Marvel movie or, you know, paint Batman or whatever it is. You know, whatever that whatever the top tier of your field is, yeah. you know, you get you get signed to play shortstop for the Yankees, you know, whatever. Right. right. Whatever you want to, whatever name you want to put on it, all of a sudden it drives you to want to be someone who is worthy of that opportunity Absolutely. and it destroys some people. Yeah. Some people it's too much. They can't handle it. Yeah. Um, other Which people. Is totally okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah it, totally, it, it, totally it, abs- it absolutely is. That's just yeah. not the level that you should be yeah. at. You shouldn't make yourself sick or destroy relationships over right. drawing a superhero. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. stupid. Yeah. And and some people just aren't mentally built for it. Yeah. I mean, they're just not. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. They should do something else. And right. other people will enjoy their work on that something else. Yeah. Um, whatever that may be. Right. Other people are, are man. They, they thrive under it. It's yeah. it's what man. The more pressure you heap on them, right. the 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 more they perform. Absolutely. It's it's a weird thing. It's yeah. like and I've and I've seen both. I, I've been both. Yeah, I've been both. When I got hired to do Conan, it didn't really occur to me that I was the Conan cover artist until like a week before that book came out. Yeah, and I had a panic attack. Yeah, I won't lie. I I, I and I'm not. It's not hyperbole. Yeah. I literally had a panic attack a week yeah. before my first Conan cover came right. out because I was so afraid people were going to hate it. Yeah. And it wasn't just one cover. It wasn't like what I do sometimes. Like, oh, yeah. well, I'm painting Wolverine this month. It'll come out and people f- will forget about it in a week. Right. I was the regular Conan artist. Yeah. And the second that I realized that, it freaked me out. Yeah. And I freaked out for about a day. Yeah. And then I got back to work and I did some of my best work because yeah. I came out the other side of it realizing, oh, well, if, if I now acknowledge that I'm the Conan cover artist and that's scary, yeah. I better step up and carry that torch with respect. Right. You know, I'm now following, you know, all the great people that have, right. you know, almost every great fantasy artist at one time or another has painted yeah. Conan. It's like, it's, it's like a a badge of honor right. that, that you want, right? Yeah. And to be the guy that even for a short period was that guy. And maybe I'm making too much of it, but I'm right. saying what was going through my head. Right. It means to, it means something to you. Right? Yeah, yeah, it meant something to me, right. Yeah. And, and I projected that on the rest of the world. Yeah. Most people probably really didn't take notice. Yeah. But, but I noticed. Right. You know, all my favorite artists painted Conan yeah. and did a stretch painting Conan. Right. You, you grew up reading Conan. Right, I grew up reading yeah. Conan and admiring the people who painted Conan. And, and I now was in that lineage. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you look at the line of, of Conan cover artists at right. some point, there's a, there's a one year span where that guy was me. Yeah. Right. And, and it meant, yeah, it meant something to me. And for a, a minute, it meant a little too much, right. but then I calmed down and I realized what it really meant. And what it really meant is that I needed to carry that torch with respect, absolutely. not, not, not crumble under the weight of it, but carry it with respect. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's, uh, like, I, uh, Again, it's very common for people to have panic attacks. I think sure. you know people think that oh, once I'm a great artist, once I have the jobs I want, that's going to disappear. But no, it makes it every, worse. Everyone deals with it. You know, <laughs> it Tom Brady, you know, all yeah. of, like every like, you know, I was reading about somebody like Adele or something having mm-hmm. panic attacks before she goes on stage. Yeah. It's like fucking Adele, right? You know, she's. Well, like, I think it was Larry Bird that would routinely throw up before games. Yeah, like yeah. regularly. Yeah, absolutely. and it's like you're talking about one of the arguably five greatest basketball players of all time. Yeah. Like I would still throw up before games. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, and I would wager that that's actually like, inc- that's amazing too. Yeah. It's like that you, that you can care about something so much that you would throw and up. And it's that caring that I yeah. think is part of what makes them great. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's hard to be great. If, I mean, if someone's great at something, obviously they care about it a lot. 
Mm. You know, so but you you have to try and find that balance. Like I'm sure in Larry Bird's case, he would he threw up and then he was like, okay, that was my self indulgence. Right now, let's go kick some ass. Yeah, yeah. Now, now I have to. You know, yeah, now I have to go out and perform. Right. Otherwise, why am I here? Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, I'm not Larry Bird. Right. right. Um, and and you know, there's there's other people like Beyonce who literally create a separate identity to deal right. with it. Yeah. So they know that she, she knows that she is not capable of dealing with it. So she creates an identity. So when she gets on stage, it's not her. Yeah. She right. created someone who, you know, some like some some low grade, you know, charismatic. Yeah, yeah. You know, low grade, you know, multiple personality disorder. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. You yeah, know, right. disassociative identity where she yeah. goes out there and for, you know, an hour she becomes someone else and that person can handle it. Right. Well, and I, I think that's, uh, you know, when people say the crazy artist, you know, the stereotype of the crazy artist, I think that's true to a degree. I think every artist is crazy to a degree, you know, it, at least the great ones. You yeah. have to look at the world in a different way and, and sometimes that can be perceived as crazy. I don't think it really is. It's just yeah. as artists, you literally have to train your brain to think differently yeah. and when you do that you're like the it it's so you're not crazy it's it's literally the ugly duckling scenario yeah. you're just not a duck right. anymore yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you know you're you're a beautiful yeah. swan yeah, thanks but <laughs> <laughs> but but you're but in for most of your time you're hanging out with ducks yeah you know, and then when you go and hang out with other swans, you realize that you're not crazy. It's yeah. just you've you've worked hard to reprogram your brain to think of things in a different way, yeah. which is what makes you an artist. Yeah. If you looked at way things the same way everyone else does, yeah. you wouldn't be an artist. Right. Um, so yeah, it kind of sets you apart. It makes you different. And sometimes it might be natural, and sometimes I think it's it's a learned thing. Yeah. You spend so much time look, you know, teaching yourself to look at things in a very literal way, like you don't. F- you don't allow your brain to fill in the gaps yeah. the way that most people do. Most people look around and they're terrible eyewitnesses yeah. because 90% of what they remember is their brain filling the gaps of what they think was there. Yeah. But an artist can't do that. Right. You have to teach yourself to really observe and carefully look yeah. at every little relationship and every little detail. And I think that messes with your brain a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to be super, super hypercritical of yourself. You have to compare mm-hmm. yourself to other people all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, uh, I think it's, um, you know, it's worth it for sure. Sure. Like if you can actually manage it. Yeah. It's also and again, if, if it's really what you want, yeah. if, if it's going to, it's going to, it's going to eat you up if it's not really what you want. Yeah. It's, it's not worth it. Yeah. But if it's really what you want, if you really enjoy sharing the stories that are in your head or the way that you like to tell stories, it's like someone who tells a really good joke. Yeah. It's like, it's like, man, don't go be a stand up comedian because you like standing in front of crowds. Yeah. That is a, Bad reason to be a stand-up comedian. Yeah, it's yeah. going to eat you up. I remember talking to somebody else. I forgot who it was on the podcast, but we were talking about how being a comedian is one of the hardest things on the planet because you have to be funny even when your dog dies. Right? Yeah, yeah. And no matter what. Yeah, right? yeah. You have to go up after some horrible thing happens and you have to go make a room of people laugh. Right? Well, I like what I, I can't remember who the stand-up comedian was, but, but a stand-up comedian said at one time that, you know, when you're in a movie... And that movie bombs. You can convince yourself that it was numerous other things. Yeah. It's like it's like oh well, the script wasn't good. Oh, the director didn't go to job do a good job. Oh, there just wasn't good chemistry on the cast. Or if you're in a band, yeah. it's like it's like oh well, it wasn't just me. You know, our lead singer isn't all that good, or, or our right. songs aren't that great. I'm not a terrible drummer, yeah. but when. <laughs> When you bomb as a stand-up comedian, yeah. that's basically a room full of people saying, we hate you. And everyone bombs. Right? Yeah, and everybody bombs at one time or another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. George Carlin, yeah. There, there's no other way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. It's like you wrote the jokes, you performed the jokes, it was you up there on the stage. So right. if it bombs, it's a room full of people saying, we hate you. Yeah. And it's kind of the same way thing with art a little bit. Yeah. It's like, you know, if you put a piece of artwork out there and people don't respond to it there's no other way of looking at it yeah well i, I think it's anonymous to a degree because people aren't that's looking. what's good yeah 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 well i think it's good and bad because people well, you yeah. know people are way less sure you know, people will they'll heckle you if you're a stand-up comedian but if sure. you're on the internet somebody will talk about like you as a per, you know and that does yeah. not feel good yeah but it's still way better than taking a piece of my artwork up on a stage and showing it to people <laughs> and having people go boo <laughs> Oh, yeah, that would be horrible. <laughs> you suck. <laughs> so yeah, you know, being a, being a, being any kind of like in person performer, especially a solo in person performer. Yeah. Oh man, I'd I'd yeah. I'd step in front of a bus. <laughs> I, I couldn't Jeez. do it. Yeah, horrible. I couldn't do it. And, yeah. Um, well, and again, I find that that's one of the more common things among artists that I really admire is that it's uh, like self critical to a fault. You know. Yeah. Um, there's there's a there's a uh, a 
more than a dash of self-loathing that goes into being a good artist, I think. I think you have to hate yourself a little bit. Yeah, right. Um, I think we've talked about this before, and when you were saying this, it was like hyperbole, and it's something that everyone says, but it's like you wouldn't necessarily recommend somebody become an artist, you know? No, I would never recommend it. I would never tell someone, hey, you should be an artist. In fact, even if I thought someone should be an artist, there would probably come a time that I would discourage them, not because I don't want them to do it or that I think they shouldn't do it, but because if that makes them quit, yeah. they're not going to be happy doing it. Yeah. If, if all it takes for you to quit being an artist is for me to say, hey, you might not have what it takes, yeah. you're, you're dead in the water. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. because you're going to get a lot worse than that. Yeah. Right. You're going to get a lot worse than that. I've got a pretty thick skin, and I still throw fits yeah. fairly regularly because of art direction. Yeah, right. So, but, I mean, I, I go on the internet, and I see people talking about you guys at the Watts or Brain. Oh, it's the worst. It's yeah, the yeah. worst. But, yeah. but, but at this yeah. point, it doesn't. that doesn't phase me as much as it did even a couple of years ago because I've just come to terms with the fact that that's yeah. just the internet. Yeah. Right. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, I actually had it explained to me by one of our students that it's actually, again, I'm getting, maybe I'm not old, but I'm getting old, right? I mean, I'm 47 years old. Yeah. And the idea of a troll, yeah. meaning so not someone who who is an asshole online, but I mean someone who actively will be on forums with people and they'll go and brag about how they'll go say things that they don't even believe yeah. just to get a rise out of people. Yeah. That concept is so foreign to me yeah. that I've just... I just accept that that's an aspect of the internet. So when, when people say stuff, they're so just just mean, yeah. just savage. I just assume it's one of those people, even if it's not, yeah. because it's not it's not productive. Yeah. And and I've had people say really critical, mean things about me online, yeah. or about my artwork. Yeah. There I go again. You know, right. judging my you know <laughs> rating yeah. myself by my artwork, but yeah. Yeah. it's hard not to say say things about my artwork and and it and it hurts my feelings. But now I just go, look, you know what? That's hurtful and it, and it's and it's mean. But when I get up tomorrow morning, I get to paint Captain America. Yeah, yeah. Well, or right. I get to paint the X Men, or I get to paint Batman. Right. It's like so. Regardless of what that guy says, my life is fucking awesome well yeah yeah. yeah. my life is great I've got an awesome wife she's a fabulous artist I get to paint all the stuff that I always dreamed I get paid to paint the stuff that I dreamed about drawing and painting when I was 15 years old when I was 12 years old so when I when I think about how ridiculous it is that I let some person that I don't even know whether they're serious or not or they're like a kid or they're a kid or they're just an angry person or whatever whatever their reason is that's like odds are if they're going on the internet and saying that stuff their motivation isn't really my artwork yeah their motivation is to make someone else feel bad right right. and there's when there's no reason that i should feel bad i've done a lot of things in my life that i should feel bad about yeah Yeah. but some guy not liking my painting of kylo ren right isn't one of them yeah so why am i letting when i when my life if i look at it from the outside should be filled with nothing but joy yeah on a day-to-day basis yeah. why am i letting that bother me right. and i still do cuz it's just the type of person i am i think that's everyone man it's but like human nature i'm really that way yeah. i'm bad like yeah. i i used to be really mentally self abusive yeah like like really really bad and that's why i i identify it in other people really easily yeah because I see it. Right. And and more importantly I hear it. Yep. When they say certain things that they that they say, I try to get them to use different words cuz even though it's Heidi flighty, you yep. know, whatever it is, word the words you choose matter. Yeah. And when I hear someone say that their drawing sucks, yep. I sit down and I have a talk with them yep. because that is not productive. Yep. Even if it's true. Right. <laughs> even yep. if your drawing does saying your drawing sucks is not productive. Right. What are you unhappy with about your artwork? Right. The edges don't work. The proportions are bad. The right. values are off. These are things that we can improve. Yeah. I can't imp- I can't make your drawing not suck. Yeah. I can make the edges better. Yeah. I can make the proportions better. We can we can do it together. Right. But I don't know what 
a drawing sucking is. I mean, right. I don't. Yes, I, I've, I've said that before. You yeah. know, it's like, ah, oh, that, that painting's horrible. Right. The painting is awful. But that's not productive. That, yeah, does, yeah. that doesn't help make it not horrible. It, well, I also think it hurts everyone else around you. Too. It absolutely does. Yeah. It absolutely does. Yeah. It's 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 a negative mindset that does not help make that not true. Right. Even if it's true, that mindset does not help make it not true. Yeah. It doesn't help make the next one not suck. It doesn't help right. this one not suck. Yeah. Even though I get it, yeah. I understand. Yes, you're right. This is a bad drawing. Yeah. This is an objectively bad drawing. But now let's talk about what makes it. Yeah. An objectively bad drawing. Right. It's like, why is this drawing not working? Let's pick two things and see if we can make them better now right. and next week. Yeah. Right. We can do that. I can't look at it. I can't help you make a drawing not suck. Yeah. That's that's literally... That's up to you. That, yeah, that, yeah, that's not... That, that, nobody can do that. Because yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just a word. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a judgmental word. It's entirely subjective. Right, right. right. And, and again, I'm not saying this from a new agey, feel-goodery kind of way. Right. I am very critical of lack of competition. I am very critical of a lack of self-judgment. Right. But it's the words you choose yeah. that are important. Yeah. It's like saying that my proportions are bad, my values are too dark, my drawing is half-tone heavy, and my edges are too hard. Yeah. Those are all still essentially saying my drawing yeah. sucks. Yeah. Right. But they are things that we can improve. Yeah. They are a metric that right. we can improve. Yeah. If you're If you're training to run a 5K, it's like, well, I'm a terrible runner. Well, okay, but what do you mean by that? Well, my endurance is poor. Ah, right. now we can work on something. Right. We can work on your endurance. I am too slow. Right. I can run my max speed for a long time, but I am too slow. Ah, right. we can work on making you faster. Yeah. It's right. like, it's, it's the words you use. You need, people need to work on establishing a bullet list of things to improve right. rather than a blanket self-judgment. Yeah. One is a blanket self-judgment, which while may be true, yeah. It does not help you to get better. Right. And you know what? Everybody sucks at one time or another. Yeah. If you're good at something the first time you do it, that thing's probably not worth doing. Well, and everyone sucks at everything right now, depending on who right. they compare themselves to. Sure. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's certainly a sliding scale as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There's like five people in the world that can legitimately, universally say that they don't suck at art. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, know? but even they would feel like, oh man, I, you know, yeah, they, <laughs> they're full of it. Maybe. They're they're full. They know. <laughs> yeah, okay. They know. I, I understand right. that. Yes, they want to get better, but right. they're they're full of it, and they yeah, know. I guess so. You yeah. know, they know. And and I've come to terms with that recently. That when I say stuff like that, I know what I really mean. Yeah. It's right. like I, I I know where I am on the on the big scheme of things. Yeah, yeah. And they're pretty good. And yeah, I, you know, no one's gonna, you know, no one's gonna threaten my life for how bad my artwork is. You know, it's like it's not really that important. Right. You know. What I do isn't that important universally, and I'm pretty decent at that not very important thing. Right. Well, I, and I guess I, I, I have the same thing where I am too so critical of myself sure. as well. And I think that... I think it's important, but yeah, it's something I, I that needs to be controlled. Absolutely. But I, I also think that the act of you drawing has made you better at that. Oh, absolutely. Well, on yourself. Absolutely. Because right? it's made oh, yeah. you, like, okay, I suck at drawing, but... It made you be self-critical of sure. yourself because then you couldn't get results otherwise. It makes you confront right? it. Yeah. It makes right. you confront that that character flaw. And I would I would wager that that's where the value and the meaning in drawing comes from for you right. to a degree, right? It's like it allows you to confront something deeper inside yourself. Yeah, it's yeah. not about the drawing necessarily. It's right. about what it allows you to change in yourself. And you that's know? and that's universal. Don't shelter yourself. Yeah. Because that's that's not improving or eliminating character flaws. It's it's just hiding them. Yeah. It's it's running away right. from them. Yeah. It's like, you know, staying home doesn't doesn't eliminate your social anxiety. Yeah. It just masks it right. because yeah. you're not yeah. going out into society. Absolutely. Well, you know? and I you know, I've been reading a lot about archetypes and stories and mm -hmm. like the precursor to the king is the fool, you know? It's like you can't be a great painter until you're a horrible painter. You can't yeah. be a Oh, horrible. It's... You can't be a great musician or a great comedian until you bomb in front right. of hundreds or thousands. Well, or, or the hero, hero's journey yeah, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's yeah, all yeah. The, the same basic idea. I mean, there's a reason why every single one of those stories, they start off with some sort of a mentorship figure, yeah. and then at some point that mentorship figure gets taken away from them. Yeah. Because as long as you've got your mentor around, why would you go off on your own? Right. It's like you've always got them to turn to. Right. It's like, but And that's what I always tell my students. Like My job isn't to make you dependent on me. Right. My job is to make myself obsolete. Yeah. Right. It, by, by the time I'm done with an artist, they should not need me anymore. Yeah. They should be able to go and sit in their studio. And yeah, maybe they'll hear my voice in the back of their head somewhere. But right. 
but that's really their voice. I'm not right. actually literally in their head, right? right? They now have a little piece of me that they've taken with them, right. and so they no longer need me anymore. Yeah. You know, that's that's being that's being uh, self-assessing. It's right. not it's not me. Right. It's just me t- having taught them to do it themselves. Absolutely. And that's really my goal. I want all my students to be independent and yeah. go and, and work on their own. I don't want them to rely on me. Yeah, yeah they, you don't want them to be taking classes with yeah. you for 10 years or 20 yeah. years or something. And that was very hard for me for a long time because I am still very close to Jeff. I mean, we yeah. see each other all the time. Um, and, and so it was it was a weird movement away from him at, at some point yeah. where I almost had to actively not pursue his input even though I needed it right but in the short term I needed it but in the long term I needed to not need it anymore yeah um, and now I'll still go and get Jeff's input and ask his advice on stuff but you know it's 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 a it's a rare occasion because yeah. you know I've kind of moved you, you know it's it's almost more just camaraderie now at yeah. this point right you, you know? and you'd rather figure it out figure it out on your own right right because Jeff's not always going to be there yeah so. well I, I think that's the idea of killing your father in yeah, a, yeah. In a metaphorical sense. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, I mean, you're not literally killing Jeff. Right, right. You know. No, absolutely. Yeah. But again, yeah, it's like the hero's journey. Yeah. yeah it's like, absolutely. you know, Luke has Obi-Wan, and uh, of course, following the formula, Obi-Wan yeah. gets killed, and yeah. Luke has to do it for himself. Right. You know, so. Yeah, even if he's a worse Jedi. Yeah. Right? And then he literally hears Obi-Wan's voice in his head, right? right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. And it, there's a reason Star Wars resonates with so many people. It's so yeah. literal. Oh, it, it is know? so. I mean, it is, yeah. it is, it is textbook. Just beating you over the head with it. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I mean, and a lot of the stories that w- that resonate with large groups of people. I mean, you've got you've got uh, Star Wars, which follows it to the letter. You've got Harry Potter that follows it to the letter. Most mo- most comic book heroes follow it to the letter. There's no yeah. mystery that that so many of them are orphans. Yeah, right. they're almost all they're on their own, and then they have some sort of a mentorship figure, and then that mentorship figure is gone. Well, I, I, I guess I guess it's like when I see somebody, when I see that thing in myself where I'm like, oh, I suck at drawing or I suck at something, I see that as actually like a, the call to adventure. You know? right. It's like, oh, that's something I can do. Sure. You know? And I would say like when you look at it in a Star Wars sense, the dark side and the light side, it's like the dark side is being like, I suck, I can't do anything about it, I'm right. you know, horrible. And the light side is being like, oh, yeah, you know, I could improve on edges, I could improve on right. proportion, you know, I could improve on whatever, right? Uh, the funny thing is, now we've moved into this era of sort of like postmodern jo- Joseph Campbell, right? Yeah, yeah. Where it's like, you know, you look back at the the original Star Wars trilogy and you had the dark side and the light side. Yeah. And if you go to the dark side, then you're a bad person. If you stay on the light side, you're a good person. Or you look at Karate Kid. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, uh, you know Miyagi Karate is, right. is good and Cobra Kai, Cobra Kai Karate is good. Now you're moving to this sort of postmodern <laughs> era, era where, yeah. where the new trilogy of Star Wars kind of rejected that idea of yeah. a light Jedi and yeah. a dark Jedi, right? right? That there's balance in the Force. Yeah. And Cobra Kai is doing the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's finding right. that, that balance between the two. I'm waiting for a follow-up to the Harry Potter series where it's yeah. going to turn out that you Voldemort know, was a good guy. Yeah, not so much a good guy, but maybe he yeah. had some points. Well, well yeah, I, I mean, uh, I remember before Disney bought Star Wars, there was canon that Emperor Palpatine was preparing for an invasion from another civilization. The Yuuzhan Vong, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you had a point, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. So, no. But yeah, it's, it's you know, being, being a zealot on, on either side isn't yeah. going to really... You know, yeah. you need to be a balanced person. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, well, and I, I would wager, again, that little bit of neuroticism inside you has made you a more successful person. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's given it's, you more of a purpose in life and... You know. And that's why I love it when people go and study other schools of thought and art. It's like, yeah, I teach the Riley method, and I've actually even borrowed from you know a lot of other stuff. I've borrowed, borrowed from Steve Houston. I've borrowed from How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. I've I've borrowed from uh, 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 Loomis. You know all this stuff. Uh, Vanderpool. I've borrowed from a lot of them. Bridgman. Bridgman. Yeah, and and brought them into it. Um, or we all have at the school. We have not just me, but the the school has. But I still. That's our core method of teaching is the Riley method but I love it when people go and study site size on their own because I think it's important yeah. I think there, there's there's bits and pieces that can be taken from anything and added to it if you're a purist you're, you're limiting what people yeah. can do right. Riley isn't always going to have the right answer yeah. it'll have an answer right. but it's not always the best answer I should right. say right 
you know, so I've, I've, I've studied a lot of different ways of approaching and I always kind of, kind of come back to Riley because I think it's a great sort of, uh, it works for you. Well, it's also a good foundation. I think it's very easy to add yeah. other things to Riley. Right. It's not really a purest way of working. Yeah. Whereas site size, it's like, I think it's a great tool and I think it's a great way of learning, but to do site size, either you do site size or you don't do site size. Yeah. You can't really, once you add other things into site size, it's right. not really site size anymore. Yeah. Um, so, right. um, I, I think the importance for me is that showing that there are many different ways to skin a cat, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like you can get to, sure. like you have a finished drawing, but then there's a billion ways of doing yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Absolutely. Um, and Absolutely. And to me, it's usually a matter of emphasis, yeah. really, than, than a matter of difference. When I, What I've really discovered as I've studied uh, different ways of approaching it, that they're not really different. They just put the emphasis in a different area because yeah. the 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 target they're shooting at is different. Yeah. You know, if you're doing animation, the 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 emphasis is obviously, obviously going to be a lot more on gesture yeah. and movement. So they're going to emphasize that idea of gesture and movement, that wild, you know, crazy line, which is how they a lot of them teach yeah. life drawing for animators, right? Yeah. And then for comics, it's going to be very structure driven. I mean, yeah, there's gesture in there as well, but it's very very structure driven. You're getting those cool cylinders. Yeah. You know, it's like you're getting all that in there. And then sight size, it's 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 very much about just it's careful measurement yeah. and and looking at you know the the relationship relationships of everything right. uh, so it's just the emphasis is different but it's not like it's not like sight size doesn't have gesture yeah. it's not like sight size doesn't have structure right. they all have gesture structure edge right. You know, it's it's you know shape, value, yeah, edge, structure, gesture. Same, it's right. it's all. Yeah. It's just a matter of personal preference. Yeah, it's like cooking, cooking to taste. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, yeah. what's strange to me is seeing people argue in online or in general in the same way that you know people would re- argue about religion. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's really strange yeah, to yeah. me. It's and they're order, they're arguing about ridiculous semantics too, right. like picking like the most obscure, stupid thing that doesn't really matter and arguing over that when they agree on ninety percent. Right. Yeah. Sorry, cameras are dying. That's right. I need to probably get going anyway. Okay, cool. Uh, you want to wrap it up? Sure. Cool. Uh, well, how should people follow you? Uh, people should follow me on uh, uh, Instagram. It's oh, probably I'll the best place. The, put it on the, the thing. Yeah, <laughs> point to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, so Instagram is probably the best place. Um, I actually have two different Instagram accounts. One is uh, EM Gist and one is Eric M Gist. Cool. Uh, EM Gist is my illustration stuff. Eric M Gist is my teaching and whatever academic stuff, I guess. Um, I, I am on Twitter, but I don't post as much on there. Yeah. And again, I think that's EM Guest. Cool. Um, my website um, is is ericgist.com, E-R-I-K-G-I-S-T.com. Um, and I am going to be getting a new website up. There is one there right now, but I'm working on a new one. Cool. That nice. will have a bunch of new stuff. So. Sweet. Cool. Well, I appreciate you doing this. And then Watts Atelier, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, can people email you? Or? Uh, probably the best way is actually to uh, uh, direct message me on uh, Instagram. Cool. That's Sweet. probably the best way. Right, and, cool. and I even check all the little, like, you know, yeah. the hidden messages or whatever they're called. Cool. Um, so I, I check all that stuff. So, that, yeah, that's probably the best way. Emails, I'm not as good about responding to emails, but if you drop me, like, a little, you know, simple one or two sentence message yeah. on on, in, on Instagram, I'll, I'll respond to it. Cool, sweet. Thank you. So, Appreciate it. You're great.